And our last informational uh, hearing of the day is with uh, the uh, Legislative Analyst's Office. Mr. Brown. And Mr. Symbol. Welcome to both of you. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members. Brian Brown with the Legislative Analyst's Office. I'm here with my <coughs> colleague, Anthony Symbol. Um, your staff asked us to put together a brief presentation providing an overview of the governor's proposed budget for the various agencies that you've heard from today. So we'll try to move through this fairly quickly, but hoping that uh, providing some uh, higher level uh, numbers for you and as well as identifying some of the key policy and uh, uh, various policy and, and um, uh, proposals that the governor is putting forward will give you some context as you move forward in your budget deliberations in the coming uh, months. Thank you. Uh, and I think you heard Mr. Gordon raise the issue of the zero based budgeting uh, at the PUC. And if you wouldn't mind adding some additional comments uh, about that. I, I plan to do so. I certainly will. Um, and so we have a, a short handout that's being distributed now, as well as our uh, recently released report on the uh, governor's budget for resource and environmental protection agency. So um, I'll refer to that a couple of times and that just uh, a resource for you. I won't go into a lot of detail, of course. Um, what I'd like to do first is if you turn to page one of the handout, uh, we have a summary table that provides for the natural resources, environmental protection, food and agriculture agencies as well as the PUC, uh, some high level numbers on their actual spending last year current uh, expected expenditure level in the current year and proposed expenditure level in the governor's budget for 1516, as well as what the change is over time. Uh, what I want to highlight here is if you, if you look down the right two columns, you can see how much has changed in each of the agencies by different funding source, general fund, bond funds, or special funds. And what you'll see is the major changes for the Natural Resources Agency, about $1.3 billion almost uh, reduction. Most of that attributable to a reduction in bond spending as well as some reduction in special fund spending. And I'll go over in the next couple of pages uh, what's driving these changes. Um, in environmental protection, you see a relatively modest decrease overall, again, partly driven by the uh, reduction in bond spending, offset somewhat by increased uh, spending from special funds. Uh, not very significant changes in food and ag, and in the Public Utilities Commission, uh, a modest increase, or actually more than a modest increase, about a 15 percent increase in special funds uh, spending. So if you turn to page two, what's, what's driving these sort of high level, the macro level, those overall spending trends in the governor's budget? Uh, probably the first thing to acknowledge, of course, is that uh, there are many, many budget change proposals the governor has put forward. By my rough calculation, you'll have 100 to 150 uh, budget change proposals that you'll be considering uh, just in these agencies, not counting transportation, over the next couple of months. So there's a lot of a lot of changes uh, that in some cases offset each other. So what are the, what are the big drivers here? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you, you saw that bond spending is proposed to go down in the budget year. The first thing to acknowledge is that in, at some level that's largely a, uh, a function of how we account for bond spending in the current year. So I want to just, without going into the weeds of that, want to emphasize that that doesn't reflect any significant policy change on the part of the governor's budget to reduce spending from bond funds. It's more has to do with how we account for the accumulation of prior year appropriations. Um, and in fact, the governor's budget for the 15-16 budget year includes two very important uh, proposals to increase spending from bonds uh, that you've actually already talked about al already, Proposition 1E related to flood protection and Proposition 1, uh, the water bond approved by voters in 2014. Um, with respect to Prop 1, uh, we do have a, a more in-depth write-up uh, about that with some comments in there um, in our uh, analysis that we handed out. I think the key issue there that you're going to be faced with in the coming months is how to uh, evaluate the trade-offs of expediting funding, ensuring that funding goes out for high-priority flood protection projects in the state, but at the same time maintaining your historical oversight role over, over these types of projects. The administration is proposing to not only appropriate the final $1.1 billion from Proposition 1E, but also to have, that, have a 10-year appropriation with uh, 
administrative flexibility to move money around among different projects and different pots of funding. Uh, with respect to Prop 1, we have a separate port. I didn't bring that with me, but that's certainly available to any of you uh, should you request it. Uh, but we have a uh, report on Prop 1. As was mentioned by uh, the Secretary, there's $533 million in initial appropriations from Proposition 1 for a number of different uh, programs and proje projects, uh, about 10 or 15 different uh, appropriations. And um, our main comments there in our report on that proposal really, uh, and again, won't go into them, know that you'll have subsequent hearings to, to discuss all of these, but are that uh, you'll want to ensure in your oversight deliberations that departments are administering these bond programs so that the dollars are put out for the most cost-effective projects. Um, as I mentioned, special fund spending, some significant changes there. Uh, Within the uh, Natural Resources Agency, you saw a decrease in special fund spending. That is largely uh, similar to the bond uh, expenditures, kind of a, a technical adjustment in the Energy Commission. Uh, there are some uh, carryover, carryover dollars from prior year appropriations, so that's not really, that doesn't really reflect a significant policy change. However, in the Environmental Protection Agency, you see an increase in special fund spending. This largely reflects a single proposal uh, that you'll uh, review this year uh, to implement SB 445 from this past year to increase the fee that funds the underground storage tank cleanup fund. So that's a $187 million proposal in the State Water Resources Control Board. If you turn to page three, uh, you saw also that the Public Utilities Commission has an increase in uh, f uh, special fund uh, uh, appropriations <coughs> proposed. This again largely reflects a single, um, a single proposal, uh, the Universal Lifeline Telephone Program. The Commission last year approved a, um, an action to uh, expand the program to allow low-income households to access this program for uh, wireless services. And so you have a BCP in front of you this year to implement that. Um, with respect to general fund, there's actually uh, not a lot of changes in general fund overall. There's, uh, among these four agencies, a modest increase in general fund spending of about $60 million, about 2%. Um, in fact, a lot of this is, uh, again, more of a technical issue. We're having to provide some more funding, general fund spending, to pay down debt service. So general obligation bonds that have been approved in prior years, we now have to pay the debt service associated with paying off that borrowing, and that's the largest chunk of that increase. So otherwise, uh, pretty flat. Um, I would note, however, that the budget does include in control section 6.10, uh, general fund spending for deferred maintenance projects. Um, I believe you heard some of the secretaries refer to that. Uh, about 31 million of that is for departments under your purview, the largest of which is $20 million for the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation. Um, you'll uh, probably want to review those proposals in your coming months to, to ensure that the projects that they've selected or intend to select uh, will be consistent with your priorities. If you turn to page four, um, I wanted to highlight a couple of key issues that uh, we've identified in our report uh, that, while not big drivers of uh, overall changes in funding level at a high level. Uh, we think they raise very important policy and oversight issues for the committee. And so just want to highlight those very briefly. The first of which you talked about already, the cap and trade auction revenues. Uh, we have projected um, or expect based on uh, data we have to date that revenues will probably be significantly higher than what was proposed in the or estimated in the governor's budget. That raises some uh, important uh, policy decisions for you about how you would want to spend that additional revenue. It's true that uh, a certain share of it is continuously appropriated to certain programs such as high-speed rail and sustainable communities, but that leaves a lot of funding uh, at your discretion. Um, we note too there are a couple of funds uh, in, uh, the governor has identified as having structural deficits, the environmental license plate fund, and a couple of funds uh, related to uh, uh, enforcement of uh, mining regulation. Uh, and so these, these issues are important because you'll have to identify as you review these funds what the appropriate funding level is for the programs that are supported by these funds, uh, what the appropriate revenue source is, and whether the particular activities, uh, how to prioritize among the various activities that historically have been funded by these programs. 
Um, the next two issue, the uh, Cal Fire Helicopter Procurement and the uh, Air Resources Board Southern California Consolidation Project have, are, are similar in one sense, which is these are both um, projects that are expected to be hundreds of millions of dollars projects. Uh, there's not much funding requested in the budget year. They're just taking the initial steps, uh, or the, the, that's what's being proposed. Um, but at this stage, despite the, the size and scope of these projects, well, we've raised some concerns about whether the uh, relevant agencies have provided you with sufficient information to understand the full scope, cost, and funding mechanisms that will be used to support these projects. And then lastly, before I turn it over to my colleague, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, the zero-based budget. Again, this is another proposal that uh, really has no dollars tied to it, but we think raises some important uh, policy questions for you. The legislature two years ago did require PUC to uh, provide, develop and provide to you a zero-based budget. What they've done is put together um, a very descriptive document about their programs and funding levels, but it doesn't have the type of analysis you would normally associate with a zero-based budget. Accordingly, we'll raise to you over the course of, the, uh, of hearings when you take this issue on in more depth um, some options for you about how to think about uh, what you want to do moving forward if, if the original intent is still a priority for the committee for the legislature you may want to think about some additional options uh, to have them provide the type of analysis that was probably intended in the first place. Um, with that I'll turn it over to Mr. Symbol to talk about the Transportation Agency. Thank you Mr. Brown. Mr. Symbol. Thank you. Just want to make a few comments about the proposed budget for transportation. Mm -hmm. Continuing on the handout if you turn to page 5 uh, we provide just a big picture summary of the, the governor's proposed budget for transportation. Uh, this figure lists some of the major funding sources as well as the major departments such as Caltrans and the High Speed Rail Authority. I just wanted to point out two things on the figure. The first is you'll see that the governor's proposal um, assumes a higher level of expenditure significantly for the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, that just increased expenditures um, as the project moves forward. Most of the increase is of, of bond funds from Proposition 1A. These are funds that have already been appropriated by the leg legislature that will be spent uh, at just a much higher rate in the budget year. Um, the second thing is towards the bottom of the figure, um, the state transit assistance program. As you can see, it, it reflects a, uh, the figure reflects a reduction, a significant reduction on bond funds that primarily just reflects the spending down of the funds that was provided to um, local transit as part of Proposition 1B back in 2006. So that's the reduction there. Um, in the coming months, the, the subcommittee will be dealing with a lot of different issues in transportation. What I want to do on the last page of the handout is just highlight three different issues, um, three of the major budget issues that will be before you. Uh, the first is a road user usage charge pilot program. And um, this was mentioned earlier. The governor's budget does include funding to implement legislation that was recently enacted that requires the development and the implementation of a road usage charge program. This is basically trying to look for an alternative way to fund transportation outside of the gas tax by charging individuals for a per mile of charge of the amount of miles they drive. Um, in thinking about the proposal that we just advised later, you're going to want to ensure that the budget appropriately appropriates the funds for this pilot program as you envision. The legislation laid out a process that you required the California Transportation Commission to develop an advisory committee. So you just want to make sure that the, the, the way the governor is proposing the funds are in line with your priorities. Um, a second area you're going to want to focus in on is that the governor's budget has various proposals that increase expenditures from the motor vehicle account. This account generates most of its revenue from vehicle registration fees as well as driver's license fees. And some of the pro proposals the governor has is two main areas, both dealing in the area of capital outlay, and that is to create new facilities, replace facilities, both at the California Highway Patrol and the Department of Motor Vehicles. While those create some cost pressures in, in the budget year, it also creates significant cost pressures in the out year. This is part of the governor's um, five-year infrastructure plan to replace facilities at both of these departments. So in thinking about those proposals, as well as other things the governor wants to do, and you may want to do with the motor vehicle count, you're just going to want to make sure about the condition of that fund and whether there's going to be enough funds available to meet all those obligations, should, should you approve of them. Um, the last area I wanted to focus in on is on the high-speed rail project. Um, as you know, um, the first phase of the project began in the Central Valley back in 2012 on what's called the um, initial construction segment. Um, given the amount of uh, investment the state has made in this project, um, the legislature is going to want to you know, provide some oversight over the project. 
Um, this initial segment is supposed to be completed in 2018. To the extent the authority is not able to complete that on time, that could create some additional co cost increases for the project. So we'll be providing you with recommendations on how you may want to provide oversight over the project in the next coming months and coming years. Um, so those are some of the major issues. In the coming days, um, our office will be providing you with specific recommendations on these issues as well as other issues. But as you can see, there's a lot of different areas where we're going to be suggesting you provide oversight over the administrating department. Thank you. We have a question from Mr. Williams. Just want to give you the kind of the uh, local perspective of oversight over the CAL FIRE helicopter issue just so that you guys can put that in your analysis. You know, this is something that's come, I think, much more from the grassroots local communities, especially in Southern California, because um, uh, we have sundowner winds. Uh, so fires spread not generally during the day, but at night. And our current fleet has no night flying capability, um, which is a, a flaw. Um, so I think your, your analysis is correct that they're not charting out how they're going to pay for it, so it's almost more oversight of them not squirreling away enough money for it, uh, maybe, um, instead of doing too much, uh, because, you know, these, uh, the question is, when, when will there be set aside enough to actually purchase a craft uh, that has enhanced capability? Thank you. And Mr. Gordon, and then Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Brown, uh, going back to the PUC and the uh, zero-based budgeting, it, so I, I want to make sure I understand this clearly. You, you're suggesting that what they provided is more informational, but that lacks the depth uh, of analysis. Um, given a specific example, I mean, is there, uh, not enough definition, perhaps, of um, you know what certain personnel do. Um, how does that play out? That's right. Uh, there, uh, we do cover this in, in more depth, than, as I mentioned in our report. There are a number of different types of zero-based budgets, so it's not a clearly right. defined or singular uh, type of product. But what is consistent among zero-based budgeting typically is a level of analysis that allows you to evaluate uh, whether you have the right level of resources to meet a particular mission, whether you ha can provide particular set of services more efficiently, um, or whether there's an optimal uh, level of resources to provide to, to meet some particular goal. So those ty that type of analysis, and, that, and that's what's lacking. Mr. Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, does the LAO still uh, stand uh, uh, behind its essential analysis uh, that the use of uh, cap and trade funds <clears throat> for um, high-speed rail, uh, given that its emissions footprint uh, won't be reduced for a 30-year. Do you still stand behind your analysis, which is essentially critical of the use? When we looked at this issue initially a couple of years ago, we, you know, we did raise some issues for, for consideration. And one of them was were really whether or not this use of the fund, cap and trade funding was the most effective use other, compared to other alternatives. So that, that's the extent. Is this really maximize the benefit in terms of greenhouse gas reduction? On the legal issues, um, it's something that we, we raised a couple years ago, as you mentioned, and we continue to advise the legislature, no matter what you decide to use the cap and trade money for, whether it be high speed rail or another activity, that you're going to want to consult with legislative council because of the exact reasons you mentioned, not just with high speed rail, but with other activities as well. So it is an issue that we still continue to think the legislature uh, needs to consider as it contemplates future funding from the cap and trade. Would, would your concerns not uh, be somewhat intensified if the auctions create more revenue than the um, that then is what what is proposed here uh, 250 maybe million addition in other words we're sort of on an automatic pilot here uh, with respect to cap and trade as if in fact it does generate more uh, the autopilot will essentially scrape off a significant amount of that at revenue and send it to high-speed rail, notwithstanding the concerns that have been raised over the fact that it simply does not mitigate its emission footprint for 30 years. Doesn't this autopilot effect exacerbate the concerns? Yes, the, the, the autopilot, the, the continuous appropriation by different percentages, like Mr. Brown mentioned, with 25% going to high-speed rail, yes, to the extent that, to, that we're suggesting that revenues could be much higher, it would provide more funding uh, than what's identified in the governor's budget for the high-speed rail project. 
Uh, there is litigation on, on this presently, as I understand. Is there? Right. Yeah. Notwithstanding that, I mean, what would be the reality for the state if, in fact, uh, this expenditure in a court of law was deemed to be um, unappropriate to the uh, uh, authority given to collect the cap and trade and use it? Would we be forced to give the money back? Um, I, I don't know if we know how to answer that question at this time. I, I, I think ultimately it would depend what the court ruled and what order it gave the state. Um, I suppose that's possible. That's probably something we could consult with counsel on and get back to you if, uh, if you wanted a more, uh, more firm answer than that. I, I, I would, and I, and I, I do appreciate uh, since arriving here, I think you have been one of the more um, serious and thoughtful and analytical uh, voices with respect to this kind of expenditure. Uh, and I just, for one, want you to know I, I appreciate it, but I think it's been somewhat fallen on some deaf ears here. And there are going to be some consequences, I think, to this. Um, and uh, since my youngest son is a lawyer, I'll consult him. <laughs> Perfect. We've, yeah, we, 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 we have got the whole family involved now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it looks like there's no further questions, so uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as we move forward, oh, we do need to do, uh, uh, before I do some concluding remarks, let's do public comment. Is there anyone who would like to address the committee? Come forward now. Hi, thank Welcome. you. Uh, I'm Michelle Passero with the Nature Conservancy, and we just wanted to speak to the greenhouse gas reduction fund expenditures. Um, we are pleased that the funds are being used to further greenhouse gas reduction goals and think it is really important that um, these continue so that the communities are actually um, realizing the benefits of California's program and it's a way to make climate change and what we're doing at the state level a little more tangible on the ground. Moving forward, we have a few recommendations. Um, we should continue to work towards standardizing um, the greenhouse gas reduction, how we approach that and calculate the reductions to create consistency across agencies. Um, you started with the theme of resiliency and certainly there's a lot of opportunity to not only reduce emissions but also um, make us, our communities and our natural resources more resilient to climate change at the same time. So we think that is important to keep that as uh, an element of investments um, beyond greenhouse gas reductions. And I appreciate your mention of the Lorax early on. And uh, while I'm not the Lorax, I, I, working for the Nature Conservancy, I feel like I should at least speak for the trees. Um, and we do think that this is an area, both um, trees and our natural resources and, and agriculture, where we should um, have meaningful investments in reducing emissions. Recent analysis does show that our landscapes are a bigger source of emissions than we realize, um, largely due to conversion to other uses as well as fire. And we can reverse this trend. Um, this is one of our natural assets and only asset really that can actively remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it. And we should take advantage of this and uh, look to increase funding in this area over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? All right, then uh, let me conclude uh, with a couple of comments. Um, uh, first, with uh, respect to uh, this uh, committee's consideration of budget issues going forward, uh, I think as we have for the, uh, for the uh, uh, past two years that I've uh, chaired the committee, we'll be thoughtful, purposeful, and strategic in our uh, deliberations and our analysis and, and uh, in, our, in our hearings. I did want to mention uh, uh, that, that we may want to give consideration of uh, drought relief um, as something we need to be thinking about in the near term uh, as opposed to the normal budget process. Uh, we uh, um, unfortunately are faced with a continuing drought uh, uh, much to our dismay. We did not receive the rains that uh, we had hoped to this year. And uh, at the same time, our efforts in addressing the drought from the last budget cycle have uh, uh, shown that a, a, an approach that 
looks to the immediate issues and allocates to the immediate issues can bring some success. So we had a number of communities that were faced with water uh, 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 issues, shortage issues, that we were able to address by allocating funds. And those communities are now out of danger because of those actions. Additionally, the uh, uh, very significant to allocation of additional funds to CAL FIRE resulted in very real uh, 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 successes on, on, on the ground, and these are actually successes that probably the public is not particularly aware of. We all, I think, uh, uh, felt very fortunate that there were a uh, not that there were not significant fires, but compared to prior seasons, a nominal number of large-scale fires. Um, in fact, that is, we believe, due to the allocation of these funds and the early deployment of a number of resources across the state by CAL FIRE that were uh, able to um, immediately address fires that occurred on the ground. There were I was told yesterday uh, upwards of 2,000 fires around the state, but only a small number of those became large-scale fires because of uh, the, immediate, uh, the ability to immediately address the fires as they uh, were ignited across the state. So with that said, we'll uh, uh, adjourn this, uh, uh, this hearing, and I thank you all for being here. We are